Joining us right now from New England is one of our friends from NBC Sports Boston, Tom Curran, back here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Tom? Tremendous, Rich. How are you? I'm doing well. What a! I can't believe we now live in a world where it's a post-Belichick world in New England, and we live in a world where Bill Belichick's a free agent head coach to be signed. Uh, how did we get to this point, Tom? Well, I mean, we spoke in August, and you asked whether or not Bill Belichick was on the hot seat, and I said, yes, he is. Mm-hmm. And you expressed some disbelief at that point. I think that when we look at the arc of the ultimatums that were levied by Robert Kraft throughout the last three years, and mm-hmm. certainly in the offseason, uh, it indicated that Bill had to produce in 2023 and that Robert Kraft wanted a contending football team. And he didn't just not get the improvement. He got a cratering that he didn't expect. And as a result, this is where the Patriots are. And so how did it, uh, what's the, uh, if you will, clock tick-tock of the week? What what happened once the uh, Patriots lost, uh, remarkably, the Belichick's last loss is to the Jets, which is maybe the unkindest final cut for him. Uh, what What happened after that to the point where they stepped to the podium on Thursday and did that? Well, the decision was made fairly long ago. As I reported in December after Germany, I had conversations when the Patriots returned from that game, and you and I spoke, um, and I also spoke to Jason McCourty soon after that game that you guys both did, and it was made very clear to me that a decision had been made at that juncture and that the two sides would be parting ways at the end of the season. It wouldn't happen during the season. And a parting of the ways would be the way that it was phrased. So when they sat down to hear Bill's side of things or his pitch, it was more Bill would have to somehow change the Kraft's minds. And I don't think that anything that really happened between that juncture when I learned of the decision and the end of the season was enough to flip them. Now, had the Patriots gone 6-0 and from that juncture and Mac Jones had thrown for 20 touchdowns and two picks and they just missed or squeaked into the playoffs, maybe it would have been a different discussion. But certainly it remains status quo. They went two and four from that point on. So this conversation that occurred this week was more devoted to how do we amicably move forward? And I think that the Kraft family certainly, and, and to a large degree, I think Bill, were able to get to a point where they could amicably stand in front of the media and speak directly to New England about where things were. So while I don't think that there was a great charge on to change minds, nor could they be changed, the conversation was had, and then the rest of the time, I think, was spent figuring out how do we proceed. And we still don't know how they proceed. I mean, I would have liked to have asked, is there, and you don't ask about money, but we got to do that, is there a financial component that exists still with the crafts? Is Bill still under contract and the Patriots have to pay him? Is there offset language or was it a clean split that the Patriots gave him? So all of those things we don't know right now. Is there uh, what, what about the idea that if, you know, you're saying that, because again, in Germany, Bob Kraft really wanted to win that game. I mean, for real. And, and I, I, I know that may sound absurd to many, but, the Patriots have had a foothold in the German market for a long time and and more than any other team in the NFL. He really wanted that W. And and that's when I t- turned to McCourty when we were at that walkthrough in um, in the stadium the, the day before and Kraft spoke to the team. And I turned to Jason. I'm like, does that usually happen? And he says, no, not really. And Kraft even <laughs> said that, you know, I, I, I very rarely speak to the team. And I, and I did. He wanted them to win that game in the worst way, and they didn't. So it makes complete sense that a, a dis- and, and the way that they lost it too. I mean, Mac Jones got benched, Bailey Zappi with a fake spike for the last interception to seal it. So that's a long-winded wind-up to say if that was the chasm and the split, then Belichick must have known that was it. So wouldn't he have, you know, beaten the the sticks to see where his next opportunity would go? Did he really make a play to try and stay in New England this past week? What do you think? I don't think there was any conversation had. I actually am certain that there was no conversation had with Bill Belichick between he and the Kraft said, it's going to be over in a few weeks. Right. I don't think the Kraft wanted to pollute Bill with that thought. Um, You know, Bill is a proud man. 
and to be told you're a lame duck, just keep coaching, buddy, was not going to cut it. So did Bill read the handwriting on the wall and start to make moves? I don't know. It's certainly judging by his conversation on Monday with the media. He sounded like a guy who wanted to stay here, said he would keep coaching until he was told otherwise and doing his job. So my belief would be that his intention was to make a case to stay here in New England, but he's not naive. So where he has laid the groundwork, I do not know, Mm -hmm. whether it be in Atlanta, which Mike Lombardi has indicated, whether it be anywhere else. I mean, he has spoken so glowingly of the Jones family that despite all of those wonderful things that Jerry Jones has said about the coaching staff this season, it still does beg the question. There's a difference between Mike McCarthy and Bill Belichick. And if the Cowboys flame out, do they go after Belichick? Or do they look at it and say, man, it's a, it's a guy whose team just went 4-13. and 13. Do they say, Rich, hmm. yeah, but he went 4-13 and because his personnel was horrible. He's not in charge of personnel here. He'll be in charge of coaching the football team. All of those things would enter into any owner's mind right now is, who am I getting if I hire Bill Belichick? Tom Curran here on the Rich Eisen Show from NBC Sports Boston. And uh, before we just return to Belichick's future, Gerard Mayo is the new coach. And, you know, Bob Kraft, when he did meet with the media, says we're going to move relatively quickly. And it appears the fact that they're able to move that quickly is is that it was already in Mayo's contract. So Belichick probably knew that too, right? I mean, was that a dynamic playing out behind the scenes that he knew is the, the next coach was right there? Tom? Whether he knew it was written into the contract or not, Rich, I cannot – I can't say, okay. but the fact that I can't say it because I don't know, but the fact that Robert Kraft referred to Gerard Mayo as an heir apparent in March at the owners meetings, the fact that he sent out a press release, which was unprecedented saying that we are working on renegotiating a contract with Gerard Mayo to keep him here long-term. And then when the title that he got was just linebackers coach, There were a lot of reasons to understand that Gerard Mayo was the person that they wanted to succeed Bill Belichick. And there are a lot of reasons to recommend Gerard Mayo as the next head coach, whether it be his personality, his charisma, his ability to lead, his knowledge about football, or the simple fact that the Patriots defense under Gerard Mayo and Steve Belichick was friggin' lights out all year. I mean, Bill's spending his time primarily in offensive meetings and with the offensive line. The defense was not something he was coaching on a day-to-day basis. It was absolutely his blueprint. All those guys know everything they know about NFL defense and coaching because of Bill, but it was that defense is Gerard Mayo and Steve Belichick and the players this year executing what Bill's blueprint was. So, yeah, long story short, Bill probably certainly understood, and I think that there were times, I know there were times this year, where the dynamic was extremely awkward between them. So it's funny, Rich. Do you think that Gerard was – do you think it was a misstep? What do you mean? By the Crafts? To do what? Do you think it was a misstep by the Crafts to put that language in Gerard's contract because they didn't want him to go elsewhere? No, I I think it it now proves if they wanted him. If if this entire time they're like, this is the guy – They've seen it. They hear how players react to him behind the scenes. They see how he reacts to them. He sees how they see how he handles things, and they love him. It put, makes no mistake for them to put it in there because it allows them to strike quickly. The question, I think, and then we'll, we'll see if it's a mistake based on how he's actually the coach, and I do want to ask you a couple of questions on what things might look like it, with, with Mayo at the helm, but it does beg the question – Mike Vrabel sitting out there, and I'm sure there's a ton of folks up there where you've parked your car to have this conversation, which I greatly appreciate, uh, are, are going to be like, wait a minute, uh, we know you love Mayo, and we know he's there, and we know him, you know, we know he's been a patriot forever, but Vrabel's free. You gave him a red jacket. Was there no consideration of Mike Vrabel because this language is in the contract, Tom? They didn't deviate. They've been extremely methodical in everything they've done. And the indications I got this week after Vrabel became available is we love Mike Vrabel. But 
the direction that we'll be going in will will not be impacted hmm. by the presence of Mike Vrabel. We've been methodical in what we've done, and we intend to go through with this the way we intended to. Now, had it not been written into the contract, would that be different? There's no way of really knowing. I will say this. The intention in signing Gerard Mayo to a two-year deal in the offseason and signing Belichick to a two-year deal at some point this past offseason was that the two guys' contracts would expire at the same time and then Mayo would elevate. That was supposed to happen after 2025. God willing that Bill was going to break Shula's record. But no one, and that's the thing is, nobody saw 4-13. and 13. I didn't see it. You didn't see it. Nobody saw it. A bad Patriot season means seven wins, not four, not two wins after 12 games or whatever it was. So what does it look like with Gerard Mayo in charge? I mean, again, what does everything look like with anybody not named Belichick in charge, right? I mean, there's been one way of doing things for 24 years in that building and in that organization. What's your best guess on how everything looks, Tom? Much more collaborative, Rich. You're not going to be able to see that on the outside, but as Robert Kraft said yesterday, you need his managers. And he tried to not make this about Bill, but he said, look, every good manager needs some doctor knows around them. People who will say, this isn't a great idea. This isn't something that we ought to be doing, who will give pushback and feedback unfettered. And over the course of 24 years here, everybody's brain was formed by Bill relative to football, whether it be personnel or coaching. So some guys, even if they pulled at the reins a little bit, mm. it's hard to go against Bill and his authority. So you'll see a more collaborative approach here, I think. I think the tenor of the organization will change fairly drastically, you know, from being kind of the Kremlin to, I don't know if it's, you know, a new day in America, continue <laughs> with, <laughs> but it's morning in America, right? That's it. Um, but it's, it's going to change in that way as well. But the bottom line is if Gerard Mayo and whoever is in charge of personnel can't get the quarterback right and can't get the offense to a point where they don't score six times offensively touchdowns. I mean, Rich, they had six games where they didn't score a touchdown. If they can't improve that, then Gerard Mayo will be out like Bill was out. I would imagine he'll get a little more time because he's, taking over an expansion level offense but this is critical that you get the right players any idea what number three overall is going to look like you don't have any idea nobody does no i don't i don't because you know so many things can happen even on that night say drake may drops to three now Jaden daniels and drake may are sitting there and somebody's taking marvin harrison and there's a team behind you that says my god we need to have drake may well, all of a sudden that third overall pick mm. can set you up for not just this draft but the next draft so the Philadelphia Eagles were able to execute that a few years ago. They manufactured a loss against the New York Giants. They went from like 11 to 6, traded again, went down, got Devontae Smith. And the next year they got, I can't remember who it was, but it was a talented defensive lineman from Georgia. So There's it's Jordan hard Davis. to say who you'll get. Yeah, it's Correct. Jordan Davis. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I hear what you're saying. Do you get the quarterback before you get put the foundation in, or do you get the foundation first? And if you, knowing that you're probably, God willing, not going to be up in the top five again, if you start to get things right. And I don't, I don't think you have a crystal ball in your uh, glove compartment, but if you do have one in your glove box, what, what's what's Belichick 2024? He is what fall of 2024. Bill Belichick is, and you can choose anything on on TV, uh, and the coach of fill in the blank. What do you got for me, Tom? I think guess. TV is the best move, believe it or not, even though he is uh, a septuagenarian. I think TV would be a great move for him because it gives him an opportunity to go, bounce his grandkids on his knees, assemble a staff the way he, that he wants to, catch his breath, and pick the location that he wants to be in. And really uh, you know, figure out, how, is it, how long will it take me to get 15 more wins? Because the last two years, he got 12. So what does he want to do? And I think television would make sense. But that would be, as Bill has said in the past, like the treadmill stopping while you're still running on it. And I think that he'll most likely go coach. And again, I trust Mike Lombardi, and he says Atlanta. So 
he doesn't say Atlanta like it's going to happen, but right. just that they should come hard for his services. And I believe that that makes a lot of sense. Why? Ownership. Do you want to go to Carolina and work with David Tepper, who seems to be extremely involved? They've already hired Adam Peters in Washington. Do you want to go cross country to work with Justin Herbert? It's enticing, but it's not what we would call a deep pocketed ownership group. Chicago's not going anywhere. Who am I missing? Well, you're missing Vegas as well. Tom Brady not calling him up saying, come here, you know, and there's that. Yeah. Um, He'd have to have a short memory, Tom would, if he brings him out there. Tennessee, uh, but or obviously the the mother load you're talking about is if Dallas makes a move. I, that, I, I just find that one hard to believe, Tom. But everything else has been hard to believe. I mean, I do, too. You know, I mean, the bottom line is Bill Belichick's a free agent head coach. And I never thought I would be saying that into this microphone after uh, after our last year. And I was right. I was a naysayer in August, but I see it now. Tom, thanks for the time, brother. You're the best. How did I do keeping the phone steady? You're great. Incredible. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, you've been phenomenal. There you go. That's the Duncan in you right there. The full, the, <laughs> that's a full fuel Duncan right there. Thanks, Tom. You're the best. Thanks, brother. See you, bud. Take right care. There. The great Thank Tom Carn. You, you bet. Right back at you. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free. 